Okay, we're live, Stephen. All right, good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? Computer recording started. Thank you. Cloud recording, good. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you, and good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Environmental Protection. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. All right, fantastic. Thank you to our great Sergeant at Arms. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I am Council Member Acosta Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee. And today's oversight is on measures to improve air quality in New York City. Today, we will hear intro 19, uh, 960, which calls for air quality monitoring at designated heavy use thoroughfares. Intro 980, which calls for phasing out of number four oil by 2025 and intro 992, which calls for monitoring power plants performance and when needed, submitting comments on proposed actions. Few sensations are as frightening as not being able to get enough air. Shortness of breath, uh, known medically as uh, dyspnea, is often described as an intense tightening in the chest, air hunger, difficulty breathing, breathlessness, or feeling of suffocation. Air quality plays a significant role in the ability of humans to get enough air. Breathing polluted air can cause shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, asthma episodes, chest pains, heart attacks, strokes, and extreme cases, premature death. According to the EPA, children can be particularly vulnerable to the effects of exposure to airborne pollutants because they consume more air and water per unit of body size compared to adults, are more likely to be active outdoors during peak hours, tend to, to play closer to the ground where particulate matter concentrates are highest and because membrane barriers in their respiratory tracts are not fully developed. Even prenatal exposure has been co uh, positively correlated with heightened instances of heart wall defects, valve defects, aortal defects, low birth weight in babies, as well as heightened risk of dysclampsia in mothers. In order to protect everyone, young and old, we have to improve air quality. The bills we're hearing today are intended to protect everyone. Intro 960 would protect everyone, especially vulnerable population is consistent with Title, uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Executive Order 12898, Federal Actions to Address Environmental Justice in Minority Populations and Low-Income Populations. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 mandates that transportation agencies, such as the Metropolitan Planning Organization, and department heads of transportation conduct analyses to evaluate whether planned infrastructure will negatively affect low-income communities, communities of color, and other groups the government classifies as minority. Uh, 960 would also seek to assure that transportation impacts are monitored and mitigated, especially where impact burden at risk populations using rec recreational areas are defined in the local law. Intro 980 addresses fuel use in large buildings. Currently, buildings are allowed to use number four oil until 2030. Four oil is a mixture of number two oil and number six oil. And number four is only slightly less dirty than number six oil. Many buildings are already able to use number two oil or natural gas. 980 would amend the mandates of Local Law 43 of 2010 to phase out the use of number four oil uh, by January 1st, 2024, and ending in January of 2025. This law would require that buildings can switch to natural gas use immediately to do so, following by the buildings to clean out their fuel tanks and finally address the buildings to excavate their fuel tanks and possibly undertake remediation before replacing them. The banning of the use of number six oil studies uh, show that communities in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, many at the intersection of high rates of poverty, above 20%, and racial and ethnic minority composition above 51% are likely to convert to number four oil or natural gas combusting systems, and we're more likely to transition to number four oil. As it stands, approximately 20% of the city's total population 
bear as the cost, bears the few population of plant, bear the pollution costs of more than half the boilers of, of still combusting number four oil. Though honestly, I'd love for the phase out of all oils and going to just uh, heat pumps and, and electrification, but going to number four is a good step in the, in the right direction for air quality. Finally, intro 992 looks at the proximity of environmental justice communities to in-city power plants. While combustion of fuel for transportation and production of heat and hot water are, are responsible for a significant portion of airborne pollutants in the city, simple cycle and regenerative combustion turbines and power plants across the state, many of them use peaker plants, account for over a third of the city's daily nitrous oxide emissions while producing less electricity for consumers and cleaner sources. This local law required the Office of Long-Term Planning Sustainability to track all Department of Environmental Conservation reports on Title uh, 10 power plants and submit comments on the proposed permit renewals. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the committee staff as always, our great committee counsel, Samara Swanston, uh, our policy analysts, our great analyst, uh, Nadia Johnson, Nikki Chawa, our financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, my legislative counsel and, and director, Nicholas Wazowski, for all of their work. I want to recognize uh, that we have Councilmember Menchaca and Councilmember Rosenthal. It's always good to see you, Helen, even if I don't see you on the screen, always good to have you here. Uh, and uh, with that, I look forward to hearing from the administration. So Samara, uh, it's, it's all yours, take it away. Thank you. I'm Samara Swanston, counsel to the Environmental Protection Committee. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you'll be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the, pa the next panelist will be. Of course, we will begin with testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to four minutes, including responses. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Uh, we will be limiting council member questions again to four minutes. And now I'll hand off to council member uh, Constantinidi. Wait, now I will deliver the oath of administration to uh, Mark Chambers and Deputy Commissioner for Sustainability, Angela Licata. So let me start with Mark Chambers. <clears throat> Mark, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and honest answer honestly to the council member questions? I do. Thank you. And uh, Deputy Commissioner for Sustainability, Angela Licata, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and respond honestly to the council member questions? Okay, but we can't hear her. All right, you may begin when ready. Mayor, can you just try getting uh, Deputy Commissioner Lakata on audio, please? Deputy Commissioner Lakata, we did not hear you. We did not hear you. I certainly do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, now you may begin when ready, Mark. Thank you, uh, good morning, it's great to see everyone. Um, good morning, Chair Constantinides and members of the Committee on Environmental Protection. My name is Mark Chambers and I am the Director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I am joined today by my colleague, An Angela Licata, the Deputy Commissioner for Sustainability at the Department <laughs> of Environmental Protection. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the measures to jointly improve our city's air quality and to combat the climate crisis. As this committee knows, the fossil fuels that we burn to heat our buildings and power our vehicles negatively impact our short and long-term health. 
We know from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Community Air Survey, or NICAS, the levels of criteria pollutants are highest in areas of high traffic density, uh, high <laughs> concentrations of buildings with heat and hot water boilers, uh, industrial areas, and especially those where these sources coincide uh, and that vehicle traffic and building boilers are highest sources of pollutants uh, at the neighborhood level. Ambient air pollution is a major driver of respiratory and cardiovascular disease hospitalizations, which are of increased concern now during COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. We also know that our low-income neighborhoods and communities of color experience the highest rates of health impacts due to poor air quality, uh, due to toxic combination of high levels of pollution and a history of chronic disinvestment and racist policies. You know, fortunately, we've made uh, great progress in the last decade in improving air quality in all neighborhoods across the city. Um, and our climate policies that we've prioritized uh, for, the, uh, for their potential to improve New Yorkers health have also driven that improvement. Um, take, for example, the efforts to phase out uh, fuel oil number six by the 2020 deadline. Uh, more than 5,300 buildings have now converted to cleaner fuels, resulting in a 95% drop in citywide sulfur dioxide, SO2, um, levels and a drop in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the Climate Mobilization Act is an important next step in reducing fossil fuel use in buildings that will continue to drive improvements in air quality. Since 2009, we've seen a 37% decrease in PM 2.5 related premature deaths citywide and a 41% decrease in the, rest, the rate of respiratory hospitalizations. This represents encouraging progress, but of course we still have a long way to go. I will now turn to the pieces of the legislation on today's agenda. Um, introduction 960. Intro 960 would require specific air monitoring on heavy use thoroughfares, um, defined as traffic corridors that have traffic volume greater than the 50th percentile of the average New York City roadway corridors, or has traffic in excess of 100,000 vehicles on an annual basis. We are very supportive of programs that reduce traffic related pollutants. The negative health impacts of, uh, associated with these pollutants are well known. Uh, in the past several years, the administration has implemented several important emissions reductions programs, uh, including uh, increased use of electric vehicles in the city fleet, uh, requiring cleaner truck fuel, and of course, uh, strengthening our anti-idling program, uh, including the launch of the Building Never Idles Behavior Change Campaign last year. We support the ultimate goal and intentions of this bill and look forward to working with council to strengthen it. Uh, primarily, we would like to work with the council to prioritize allocating resources to emissions reductions efforts and to uh, exploring ways of achieving the goals of this bill in light of the city's current financial crisis. Uh, uh, intro 980. Uh, intro 980 would accelerate the city's timeline for phase out of fuel oil number four and boilers. Currently, the use of fuel oil number four must end by January 1, 2030. The city has made significant improvements to air quality over the last several years, due in part to the council's legislation, and we are always looking for more opportunities to make even more improvements. Uh, it is clear that eliminating fuel oil number six had significant impact on improving air quality around the city. Uh, neighborhoods with the highest density of boiler conversions, such as Northern Manhattan uh, and uh, Southern and Western Bronx, saw the greatest uh, improvements in air quality uh, with the greatest proportion of health benefits occurring in vulnerable high poverty areas. Eliminating fuel oil number four will continue these improvements for our air and our climate. And this is of particular importance for our most vulnerable populations. We look forward to working with council uh, to thoroughly implement this legislation and thoughtfully. Um, introduction uh, 992. Introduction 992 would require the city to report on power plant uh, compliance. Uh, the city is committed to ensuring a clean energy transition in New York City and the opportunity it provides in particular to improve air quality in New York City. Uh, the city uh, could take on activities laid out in this bill, but setting and enforcing air pollution limits ultimately do rest with the state um, and New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, they're the primary entity that regulates air pollution from power plants. Uh, we estimate that this bill would also require additional resources to track, report out, potentially comment on the Title V process for power plants. We support the council's goal of reducing air pollution from power plants and look forward to working together to transition to clean electricity. Um, we wanna to continue to center um, 
health outcomes, specifically and especially in our historically burdened communities. Um, as we plan and prioritize future climate policies and programs, our office looks forward to continuing to work together to meet this crisis head on uh, with innovative solutions, data-driven action, and fierce urgency to provide a livable future for all New Yorkers. Thank you, and with that, I'll return it back to Council. Is there any testimony from the DEP Deputy Commissioner, or I should I jump right into our questions here? I think you can jump right in. Okay, all right, just wanted to make sure. I didn't want to cut Angela off if she <laughs> had testimony to give. Uh, so good to see you both. Uh, so I guess I'll begin on 960. Uh, does the city currently employ any air pollution mitigations to use corridors? Sorry, I, I think I, I, I lost you in the last part of that question. Um, do we currently uh, employ any air pollution mitigation strategy along heavy use corridors? If so, what strategies? Sure, and, and of course, um, I'll let Angela uh, jump in as well, but the city um, does um, have uh, monitors all throughout the city. There's over 90 um, air quality monitors um, that are operated by uh, DOHMH. And, um, and so there is a wide kind of breadth of of stationary air quality monitors throughout the city, some in location to the corridors. And what strategies do they employ? This computer. Hello? Yeah. Sorry, I, I inadvertently muted myself and could not unmute myself. Oh. Okay, I, th uh, I thought it was my computer. I thought it was my computer that was flipping out again. Okay. <laughs> so just, I mean, just to, to, to add on to that, um, you know, so being able to have these monitors in place are, are part of the kind of fundamental like um, background data that allows for us to be able to to monitor and uh, and also deploy several programs that are operated um, throughout the city. Um, there are. Um, a handful of different programs and I'm, I'm happy to, to get into, but um, I just, I, I don't know if that's uh, in line with where the, the council wants questions to be asked or. No, I mean, I mean look, at, yeah. at the end of the day, I mean, I guess my next strategy is, my next question is what about strategies around areas that are heavy traffic that have playgrounds, schools? I mean, I can speak to my own neighborhood where um, 21st Street has over, you know, 2000 cars an hour has IS-126, has Long Island High School, has a senior center, has the Ravenswood houses, has the Queensbridge houses. And in heavily trafficked uh, you know, streets like that, what are we doing specifically around those types of, of streets to make sure that air quality is monitored? And, and, and if, if the answer is we're not doing it that you know that particular street or these types of streets then i'd want to know what we are doing and, and where are we doing it so that's kind of where i'd like to sort of go and if that's a long answer it's a long answer i can listen to that. <laughs> sure no problem uh so let me start, first start by, by saying that you know we do kind of acknowledge that the the shift away and the the importance of focusing on uh transportation source emissions and, and pollutants um the, there are several programs, some of which I, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that the, um, the city has been implementing in order to ultimately try to move people away from combustion um, vehicles. Uh, Green Wave uh, program, which was announced um, in summer of 29, uh, which is the city's long-term long uh, vision to improve uh, cycling um, uh, safety and encourage you know, movements to multimodal uh, transit, um, is, is one of those that has uh, been implemented alongside a record number of protected bike lanes uh, in 2020 of adding an additional uh, 28.6 miles. Uh, bike share program expansion is another uh, methodology in which there's been uh, efforts to, to move to uh, expansion of, of dockless bike sharing. Uh, Better Buses is another program that's an important, uh, which kind of looks at being able to um, increase bus speeds and reliability along the corridors um, and making sure that there's opportunities for, for mass transit and also moving out of personal vehicles. Um, we are consistently working um, with MTA to kind of plan around congestion uh, mitigation um, and being able to implement a program that would reduce congestion in coordination with the MTA as well as um, the federal government. Uh, freight programs mm -hmm. are another great example of how 
um, being able to look at um, at being able to um, implement uh, programs that would kind of focus in on deliveries, uh, which is also an increased uh, and incredible source of, of pollution and the shift trucks that we're all very familiar with um, moving uh, all throughout the city. And of course the anti-idling um, components that I mentioned before, all of these start to comprise a um, you know, policies that are built upon the data that we are getting from air quality monitoring uh, that's happening throughout the city. Uh, it's important for us to be able to look at ways in which we're able to take the NICAS data and the 90 sites and use that information alongside additional data that's coming in around um, what these different sources could be and what are our opportunities to mitigate them. I, I think it's important to recognize that you know, uh, more data does not always include better data. Um, and so for us, we wanna make sure that the city is taking the, a lot of the existing data it's getting and matching it with other data streams that allow us to pinpoint where we can actually have the most impact. Uh, it's not always about it being a block by block basis, but often at times it's about being able to model out where these sources are and getting ahead of them and then being able to use a, a strategy to kind of pinpoint how we can shift pieces within the levers that we control over the city. All right. So, I mean, but we have, do we have anything around recreational areas as well? But I, mean, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but you know where I'm going. I just believe that this bill sort of helps us sort of evaluate. Um, I know we're in a, in a time of uh, resource challenges, but I think we definitely need to put resources in the right places. And I think this does that. No, yeah, I mean, I think I think I agree. And I think that being able to to, again, what we kind of discussed uh, both in your original statements as well as mine, that being able to um, target areas where there are most vulnerable populations and like you were saying um, uh, around uh, recreation areas is also important. And I'm not sure if um, if DP has any anything to add on that, but I, I, I think we share the same goals. Okay, great. I'm, I'm just gonna turn my camera off because I'm having some technical difficulties with my Wi-Fi. Whenever it's cloudy out, my, my Wi-Fi starts to crap out. So I'm just gonna turn the camera off. So hopefully I won't, I won't not, you know, won't lose you guys. Uh, so just going on tonight, oh, I saw that Eric Ulrich, uh, council member from Queens has also joined us. Thank you, Eric, for being here. Uh, so how many registered boilers in New York City are still burning number four? I'll pass that on to Angela. Yeah, is my mic on? Yes. We hear you. Great. Um, we have about 3,000 accounts that are still burning number four. Some are burning number four and natural gas, and some are burning only number four fuel oil. So it's a combination. Um, those that are on the combo of number four and natural gas typically will burn the cheaper fuel, which is natural gas at this point. Um, but what they will do is when the supply is interruptible, as sometimes happens in the colder months, they will then shift to the dirtier number four fuel. Um, in contrast, just maybe for interest, we had about 5,300 accounts originally burning number six oil. And so a combination of those 5,300 accounts went to either natural gas and number two oil or went to number four and natural gas or number four alone. So we have been shifting from the most dirtiest fuel of number six, and as you indicated earlier, to number four, which is still a dirtier fuel as compared with number two in natural gas. Uh, and what would the complete, what would, if, what would this phase out mean by 2025 if we got rid of number four, number four fuel oil uh, on the city's air quality? What effect would that have? Have we been able to quantify it? Yeah, we actually have quantified um, that there would be tremendous improvements and continuing um, improvements in the criteria pollutants, such as the particulate matter, um, especially particulate matter of 2.5 microns or less. It would re result in reduced uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide. So really across the board um, with respect to the criteria pollutants, we would see re reductions. Um, give me one more. How many buildings? Um, how many buildings would be offer grants to uh, to go for number off number six oil? And is that an effective strategy for number four? 
I will turn that back over to the MOS around the clean um, heat program, which offered assistance um, for buildings to convert with um, financing assistance. Right. So one of the, the main assistance um, programs that I think you're very familiar with is the um, is the New York City Accelerator and the um, which is the uh, program that allows for uh, the city to provide free technical assistance to building owners to be able to implement, you know, both um, uh, energy reduction as well as like um, uh, retrofits that would kind of reduce some of the, the pollutants that we're talking about here. So boiler replacements um, combined with other interventions in, in the buildings that would allow for them to uh, be able to take advantage of these as, as much as possible. So, um, and, you know, similarly there, you know, we are, you know, in the, uh, the kind of multiple thousands of, of buildings that have been touched by the accelerator. Um, I have to come back to you on, on how many particular related to uh, to phase out, but that's one of the main programs in which the city is assisting Number building six, owners. Number six, that. Good. Did we lose it, Chair? Uh, one second. Mm -hmm. Chair Constantinides? Yes, um, I'm having internet issues. Um, I'm going to switch to another device. Okay. Uh, then we'll, so keep the, we'll hold the hearing for a couple of minutes until you rejoin us. Okay, great. Apologize for that. Just when it gets cloudy outside, my internet craps out. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, Chair Costasidides? Yes. Okay, you're back. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I had to switch to my phone my, my, and, and go off my data. It's just, um, no matter how many times I have Spectrum come in and try to fix it, it doesn't, so. Not a problem. Okay, we can continue. So just, just one last piece um, uh, related to this um, to answer, fully answer your question is that um, the, there was a Con Ed program that was all, you might also be referring to around um, um, providing um, grants uh, for conversions. And so we're happy to kind of follow up and get some clearer data uh, with NAM about how many uh, grants were issued uh, in previous conversions, previous phase out. All right. And, and on 992, I know you had talked, I know that DD, uh, DEC is the main driver on power plants. Um, but do, do we monitor New York City permits issued by DEC? So um, monitor is that we, you know, we're, we receive information from, from DEC and, and as they kind of report out, but um, you know, we don't have any, um, any requirements in terms of um, uh, kind of then re-reporting what DEC is, is, um, is publishing. But, but as part of our general regulatory posture and making sure we are um, actually representing the city for, with um, the state as well as the um, Public Service Commission, we, um, 
we do kind of take all that information to account for all of our regulatory filings, but DEC is responsible for enforcing their permits. And do we, we, do we comment on these permits as part of the, you know, fact that it's the city as you indicated? So commenting on, we, we comment generally on the procedures. We do not have specific uh, role to comment uh, on, on the permits themselves, uh, as opposed to the conditions around um, uh, general products. It's almost like we are, we're able to provide uh, yeah, commentary, but we do not have a statutory role in being able to um, determine the, anything around those permits. No, I understand. I just, you know, I'm just worried about, you know, how do we keep track? I mean, sometimes the state does things that we disagree with and knowing <laughs> what yeah. those things are. <laughs> are no, absolutely. Are and, and, and part of, part of our responsibility um, is to, and that we take very seriously is to, um, to make sure that our voice is heard um, and, and kind of use the positioning of the, of the city to file um, uh, comments you know when we feel as though there are um decisions made that are in uh, in contrast to stated kind of policy you know uh, or principles that the city holds now the thing that worries me is that you know dec issued permits for number six oil burning even we after new york city had moved in the right direction and we had sort of abolished number six dec was still allowing number six in power plants for years um, so that, that is like sort of the, the challenge here. And I think we were the first group to have a hearing on power plants, even though they're not under, as you indicated, not under our direct purview. Um, but, you know, I just want to sort of, sort of drive on the point about how, what did we, what can we do when they issue a permit that is sort of in direct contrast to what we're trying to accomplish? Right. I mean, uh, to be, you know, just very clear with you, like the, the, you know, a lot of the role that we were able to play, you know, the, a lot of this is, again is controlled by the by the state, and they have uh, ability to kind of preempt our decision making. But but our we do have the ability to continually kind of lobby both the state as well as other stakeholders to make sure that we are kind of growing a larger consensus around decisions that are we feel are in contrast to to what the city um, is is advocating for. And and so consistently, you know, if we and I'm happy to. Kind of look uh, follow up with some of our filings, but we consistently represent those those um, positions to the Public Service Commission to make sure that they know that if things are in in violation with what the city is has uh, stated policy on, that um, it's it's recorded and potentially can galvanize more additional resources around that from stakeholders. So at this time, do we have any questions from any of my colleagues? Mara? I don't see. Uh, is anyone interested in making a comment at this time? So again, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay. Um, I guess sort of the, the last question I'll ask, um, and then I'll let the administration go is, uh, when, DDC, when DDC issues a permit for a site located in communities of color, does the city notice whether the proposed boiler is new or 40 years old or, you know, you know what is our process there around uh, uh, permits issued in, in, in EJ communities? That's right. Angela, okay. Sure. Um, we, through the New York City Air Code, regulate boilers of a certain size. So whenever a new facility is located in any area of the city, we have a permit um, process and that requires a filing with New York City DEP. Um, when we have permits of a greater size, we consider that a certificate to operate. We will actually have an air engineering inspection and we will keep track of the um, fuel oil 
and the um, capacity of those boilers. So we have full on records with respect to that. If you have a more minor um, <clears throat> burning equipment, then we will consider that um, applicable for a registration. So we have two categories of registrations as well. So we have quite, quite a significant database on these fuel burning equipments. All right, so I, mean, I look forward to continuing to partner with you all on these, these issues as well as other issues. I know that we're, you know, we're coming to the end of our term. Um, so the end of my time as this chairman, we're, you know, we're a few months away of that. Uh, so I do want to do continue to do as much good work as we possibly can uh, for the people of the city of New York in the time that I have left to do it. Um, so I thank you for your service. I hope that you and all your families are safe. Uh, and at this time, I, I'll thank the administration for their testimony and go on to the rest of the, uh, uh, you know, the presentators. Chair, thank you for, for that. Thank you for, for allowing us the opportunity to, to testify today. And just to kind of comment on your, your last point, um, you've been an incredible champion for this work and have continued to, um, to both work collaboratively as well as to push as hard as possible for us to be as responsive um, to these incredible and needed um, changes throughout the city. So we also wanna thank you for being such a fierce advocate, both for New Yorkers, as well as for our collective response to climate change. And it continues to be a pleasure to, to work with you and we will continue to do so for as long as we have the opportunity to do so. I look forward to it, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no more council member questions or no council member questions, this wraps up the administration's testimony. Um, I'm going to go over the procedure now for the public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone um, that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Panelists will be limited to four minutes. I would now like to welcome Sonel Jesso who is representing REACT to testify followed by Isabel Silverman formerly with EDF but now testifying as a private citizen. So now. Hi. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Chair Constantinides, nice to see you and members of the committee. Thank you all for the opportunity to testify. Um, particularly I'm here to testify regarding uh, introduction 19, 980, addressing fuel oil phase out. Um, my name is Sonal Jessel. I'm the, the director of policy at We Act for Environmental Justice. Over the past 32 years, WE ACT has been combating environmental racism in Northern Manhattan. Um, I myself have received my Master in Public Health from Columbia University, and I'm here as an advocate expressing my support for Introduction 980 with some suggestions. Um, and this is speeding out the phase out of dirty number, fuel, number four fuel oil in New York City. Uh, it, the, the number four fuel oil produces a high level of particulate matter that pollutes our air. Since its beginning, we act for environmental justice has been fighting for cleaner air uptown. Harlem has always dealt with poor air quality in comparison to other neighborhoods. This is due to the disproportionate placement of bus depots, plants, sanitation sites, train and truck yards, um, uh, through ways creating traffic more and more. Um, the rates of childhood asthma are higher than the average rates in New York City. Other health impacts such as cardiovascular disease and now more severe cases of COVID-19 are plaguing Northern Manhattan due to environmental injustices. Uh, we act, and I'm evoking We Act's old campaign, breathe at your own risk. Under New York City's clean heat program, number six fuel oil was successfully banned. However, number four fuel oil is still allowed until 2030 and it's still a very dirty source. While many buildings have phased off this oil, it's particularly buildings in lower income neighborhoods such as ours that still use number four. Um, to quote an article from Dr. Diana Hernandez on this a few years ago, that residual fuel oil number four continues to be burned. Um, and these numbers might have been amended earlier, but about 3,253 residential buildings 
despite the city's efforts to educate and incentivize owners of these buildings, 1,724, which is about 53%, were clustered in Northern Manhattan, north of 110th Street and in the Bronx. And only about one fifth of the city's residents live in these neighborhoods. So the proportion of fuel oil being produced in these neighborhoods is much higher than the proportion of its population. Ultimately, banning number four fuel oil in 2025, which will be five years earlier than currently planned, will lead to direct air quality improvements in our community. We actually have been advocating for speeding out phase out of this for many years, and we're happy to see it come to discussion today. Um, when this bill was originally introduced, Local on 97, however, was not law. With the earlier phase out of this fuel oil, we do have some concern that will take some of these buildings longer to install more energy efficient heating sources, such as heat pumps. To mitigate this unintended impact, it's important that the city be very proactive in reaching out to these buildings that have to do this phase out to assist them in electrifying and particularly offering um, mechanisms for affordability and financial help instead of switching to natural gas or other fuel oil grades. Um, we believe that's really vital in this process here. And we know which buildings need to be targeted. We have the numbers, we know what buildings they are. So we can certainly do this reach out. Um, it really isn't too many buildings. Um, so they really should be targeted and bring them along in this electrification process for New York City um, faster than originally planned, which would be great. Uh, therefore, I am joining other advocates, experts, community members to urge the city to pass this introduction. Um, I'd also like to just quickly add our interest in introduction 19, 960, heavy truck routes such as on 125th Street in East Harlem, 10th Avenue in East Inwood are both areas that our members have expressed a lot of concern about with poor air quality due to heavy throughway truck emissions. So, you know, we'd like to see that monitoring will help implement more targeted programs. Time expired. So thank you again to our chair, uh, Council Member Constantinides for being tireless supporter of our environmental justice policy initiatives. Thanks for the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and Department of Environmental Protection for working on this as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Sono. Uh, I would now like to welcome Isabel Silverman to testify on her own behalf, followed by Carlos Castel Croc on behalf of the New York League of Conservation Voters. Starting time. Hi. Hi, my name is Isabel Silverman. Um, hello, uh, good morning, Councilmember Constantinides, and thank you for allowing me to testify. I used to work for Environmental Defense Fund, as you know, but then I actually moved to Switzerland. So I'm um, now in Switzerland, but then several people asked me to testify because a similar bill was before the council in 2017, but then the private buildings were taken out of that bill. So I did some research in 2017 and um, wanted to present that to you. So of course I'm expressing support for an accelerated phase out of number four oil. And let's also clarify something here. So, so the New York State DEC is regulating the oil tanks, as far as I, I know, oil tanks. The New York City DEP regulates the boilers. Um, the Boilers and the burners are maybe not that much of a problem here to go from number four oil to number two oil. The big problem are the oil tanks. And which is why in 2010, when number six oil was phased out, we gave this, you know, the city gave this compromise of buildings being able to go to number four oil instead of going straight to two oil or natural gas because of the oil tanks because a lot of these oil tanks that were holding number six oil were like single wall buried in the ground. And if you had put in number two oil, they would have leaked. So then they said, let's allow number four oil, which is a little thicker, a much thicker than number two oil. So these tanks don't leak. So I think the problem we have here in front of us should maybe also be looked at from a oil tank perspective, because that, those are really the problem here. So the research that I did um, showed, of course, these buildings, you know, everybody's been saying now 3,000 buildings are still burning this. Uh, three years ago, a bunch of these buildings, like over a thousand were burning. Um, they had a gas line, but we're still burning number four oil as a backup. Now, this proposed bill writes here something about 2018 that they should switch, I mean, which is in the past. So I assume that if I understand this correctly, these buildings that already have a gas line, um, 
and four L as a backup, they should be, I mean, they have to convert right away according to this bill. Um, I mean, they could go on firm gas, so they only burn gas. So that those have to be looked at, hopefully they can convert quickly. Um, but now let's draw our attention to the ones with um, above ground oil storage tanks. Now, those that just have to be cleaned can very easily switch to number two oil in the interim before they go to heat pumps or something. And oil tank cleaning is not that expensive. So, um, so they clean the oil tank and then if, they, if the oil tank can hold number two oil, obviously they can go to number two oil. So let's look at those. And then let's look at the ones above ground that are not able to hold number two oil. And then the biggest problem are the underground oil storage tanks, because those, of course, um, are often a very thin wall, you know, single walls, uh, could not hold two oil, and then the basement doesn't have space. I researched about 360 of those that have those underground oil storage tanks. Obviously, those have to be given a little more time. And um, here, maybe what you could be doing, because you're also balancing these different interests, like as we had. Uh, pointed out between you know buildings now not having stranded assets going to, you know replacing oil tanks and you want them to go to heat pumps what you could be doing is also putting the burden on the buildings being a little bit more aggressive with the phase out and then have the buildings come to you saying um, hey, by... yeah and then have the buildings come to you saying we can't do this for xyz reasons or we need more time because we're gonna go I said an alarm to, or we want to go to um, heat pumps. So I will submit the testimony also in writing, and um, just I, I would you know look at the whole thing from the oil tank perspective and how you can divide up the buildings and yeah <clears throat> make them go to heat pumps if possible and keep the cost down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. I will now call on Carlos Castell Croak whose testimony will be followed by Chris Halfnight of Urban Green Council. Carlos? Starting, starting time. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos castell Croke, and I am the Associate for New York City Programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I would like to thank Chair Constantinides for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, we are all well aware of the fact that poor air quality leads to poor health outcomes, especially for vulnerable populations like seniors and children. Specifically, concentrations of particulate matter and ozone are the compounds of air pollution most associated with health issues like respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. Air pollution is responsible for both a climate crisis and a public health crisis. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, indoor and outdoor air pollution is directly responsible for one in nine deaths worldwide. And asthma is the number one source of school absenteeism in New York City. There are many actions the city can take to improve air quality and public health, but I wanna point out two main areas that are relevant to this hearing, cleaning heavy duty fleets and reducing the use of heating oil. Electrifying heavy duty fleets such as buses and garbage trucks is essential to improving air quality. I would also like to emphasize the importance of including New York City's school bus fleet in the transition and making it a high priority for the council, as children are especially susceptible to developing asthma from exposure to particulate pollution. To maximize climate and health benefits, priority for the school bus transition should be for fleets that are older, those with high vehicle mile tra miles traveled and those traveling in and around environmental justice communities. For these reasons, we support intro 455 by Councilmember Drum to speed up transition to cleaner, safer, zero emission buses. We also support intro 960 because it will monitor air quality along heavy use thoroughfares, which we think will emphasize the heavy air pollution burden children in low income communities bear and the need to electrify school buses and other heavy duty fleets. We'd also like to express our support for intro 980 Making a push to phase out number four heating oil five years sooner than the current schedule is an easy step in fighting climate change and reducing air pollution. A large portion of indoor and outdoor air pollution comes from the burning of dirty heat oils in our buildings. Although number six heating oil was phased out of 6,000 buildings by the end of 2015, other buildings all around New York City are still burning number four heating oil, which releases large volumes of fine particulate matter into the air. 
Additionally, the use of number four heating oil disproportionately occurs in neighborhoods of low socioeconomic status, therefore contributing to environmental injustice in our city. The emissions released from burning number four heating oil are correlated with higher frequencies of cardiovascular disease, respiratory illnesses such as asthma and bronchitis, and death. The current schedule for phasing out number four heating oil from residential buildings, January of 2030, is not aggressive enough. Accelerating the deadline to 2025 is a step the city can take to accelerate meeting the air quality goals spelled out in 1NYC, as well as providing incentives for new heating technology, beneficial electrification, and energy efficiency. Just this five-year difference could mean averting hundreds of deaths and thousands of emergency room visits, but, but must be coupled with support to enable transition to clean heating. NYLCV is proud to have worked with the city council over the years in policies that improve air quality and public health, and we hope to continue the work by encouraging the passage of intros 960 and 980. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to now welcome Chris Halflight of Urban Green Council, whose testimony will be followed by Kelly Farrell of the Rent Stabilization Association. Starting time. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Chair, members of the committee. It's nice to see you again. Uh, my name is Chris Halfnight. I'm Associate Director of Policy at Urban Green Council. We're a nonprofit focused on transforming buildings for a sustainable future. Um, I'm testifying today in support of intro number 980, uh, accelerating the phase out of number four fuel oil because it will reduce air pollution from New York City buildings and improve the health of New Yorkers. I won't read my full testimony today because many of my comments echo those already made by the city and uh, very well articulated by my, my colleagues from uh, WE Act and the League of Conservation Voters, namely that this acceleration will drive significant reductions in particulate matter and nitrogen oxides and other pollutants with very serious negative health impacts and particularly in low and moderate income neighborhoods that are already burdened with high asthma rates and where in some cases the clean heat program has lagged. I'd also like, however, to echo the, the calls for stressing, stressing that this acceleration should be paired with outreach and support for building electrification. Currently, over 40% of New York City's total carbon emissions come from burning fossil fuels for heat and hot water in buildings. In the near term, unchecked, most, if not all, building owners affected by this amendment will convert to number two fuel oil or natural gas, in other words, from one fossil fuel to another. But to reach the city's climate goals, I think many in this group know over the next 30 years, we need these buildings to transition to high efficiency uh, electric systems that tap into a cleaner grid. So to support that end, Urban Green urges the city council and the administration to pair this phase out with targeted outreach and support programs coordinated with New York State to identify and assist the leading candidates in this group for building electrification. That outreach needs to leverage the existing state level rebates loans, on-bill financing and support from Con Edison, the New York Clean Heat Program, uh, Retrofit New York, and other programs. With the right incentives, some smaller buildings may be potential candidates to leap from oil straight to electric systems. And in the larger buildings, about 1,500 of that 3,000 uh, that we've discussed today reported using number, number four fuel oil in the recent benchmarking data. It's 170 million square feet of building area. So it's a lot of building space. Some of these buildings are subject to local law 97 and will face strict carbon limits in 2024 and very strict carbon limits in 2030. They may be good candidates for incremental electrification opportunities like heat pump installations in a common area or low level apartments. So in both cases, we'd like to see the city proactively seize any opportunity to encourage partial or total electrification. That way we can avoid more stranded gas assets in New York City buildings and help lay a foundation for electrification retrofits at scale in the decades ahead. Thank you to the chair and the committee for uh, moving these bills forward. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I would now like to welcome Kelly Farrell of the Rent Stabilization Association or RSA, whose testimony will be followed by Justin Wood of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Starting time. Hi, good morning, Chair Constantin and Tanides and other council members. My name is Kelly Farrell and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Rent Stabilization Association 
and its 25,000 owners and managers who collectively manage 1 million units of housing in every neighborhood and community throughout the city. We thank the committee for giving us the opportunity to testify today in opposition to intro 980. When the council passed Local Law 43 of 2010, it was recognized as important legislation that would achieve cleaner air through fuel conversions over the next 20 years. The process and timeline were clear and the real estate industry has relied on this for the past decade to make budget and maintenance choices. To be asked at this point to fast track the process by five years is both financially and logistically unrealistic. As the cost to achieve these aims are substantial, a two-step timetable was created. This phase in allowed costs to be budgeted over a multi-year period and also importantly recognized the value of monetizing the longevity of current equipment by not requiring the replacement or upgrade of equipment that was still within the recommended useful life. The full conversion was linked to coincide with boiler replacement cycles that would ease financial and compliance burdens. While the cost to convert from number six to four were approximately $10,000 per building, the cost to convert to dual interruptible systems or firm natural gas is estimated to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. At a time when recouping improvement costs has been capped by the HSTPA, vacancies are at an all time high, rent collections at an all time low and compliance costs are being ignored by the rent guidelines board in assessing rent increases. There is no funding source that would make immediate conversion possible for most owners. With this legislation, owners may be forced into making a short sighted adaptation to number two oil in a reduced conversion period when natural gas might have been the better and preferred long term solution. Boiler and, bo and burner equipment, gas lines, asbestos removal, gas meter room construction, buried oil tank remover, chimney, chimney liner, and chimney relocation. These costs, all of which are substantial, taken together means that gas conversion process can easily reach $500,000 for a modest, side build, modest sized building. Onerous in the best of times and crippling in the current conditions. Even if a building finds gas conversions are in budget, it requires access to gas lines for which the building is at the mercy of the supplier and is also subject to DOT limitations should, should opening streets be needed. These are matters beyond a building's control and can take upwards of a year to implement. In crafting the original legislation, the council recognized that the cost would be more significant to achieve conversion to number two oil or interruptible or natural gas systems. So there was a plan established to meet this target by 2030. The industry has been working diligently to achieve this despite obstacles and costs. Changing this plan at a time of industry collapse is misguided and unattainable. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Kelly. I would now like to welcome Justin Wood of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, whose testimony, uh, who may be the last, the last witness. Uh, I think Nicole Hernandez is submitting testimony. So uh, Justin, uh, take it away. Out of time. Thank you, Samara. Good afternoon, my name is Justin Wood. I'm the Director of Policy at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Thank you so much, Chair Constantinides and members of the uh, Council Committee for the opportunity to testify and particularly to the Chair for your leadership on the critical issues of climate change, systemic environmental and racial injustice and public health in this City Council. And we know that uh, this Council's Time is, is drawing to a close and we really look forward to making 2021 a year that we implement the really um, transformational change we need in this city to address all the multiple crises and intertwined crises of COVID-19, uh, environmental injustice, climate change, and of course, unemployment, um, which is at an all time high. And so uh, we're in support uh, and I, I don't need to echo all of the um, positive things have been said about the legislation that's um, being heard here today. We're also in support of these bills. I'd like to take a moment um, to sort of situate them within what we hope is a, a sort of ambitious, um, appropriately ambitious and realistic agenda um, for 2021 of additional things we can achieve on air quality um, in this council working together. Um, 
Milby, our clients and our partners would, would love to see the council take as much action as possible on shutting down dirty and costly peak or power plants cited in disadvantaged environmental justice communities and pass whatever legislation is needed uh, to facilitate the rapid expansion of solar, offshore wind and battery storage to replace um, these expensive and polluting power plants. Um, we see intro 992 uh, being heard today as a promising step in this direction and we fully support its passage. But we also call for the swift passage of intros 1591, 1592, and 1593, which of course are the Renewable Rikers Act, which would then transform that island from a toxic site with a le legacy of racial injustice to a renewable infrastructure hub with the potential to create hundreds of local green jobs and economic stimulus in the communities most impacted by mass incarceration and air pollution. Secondly, I'd like to echo what others have said um, in calling for the electrification of heavy truck and bus fleets to improve air quality and reduce climate emissions and improve wor worker health and safety in the city. And we, uh, similarly to our colleagues at New York League of Conservation Voters are very, and we act are very focused on school bus fleet as a huge opportunity given um, children's particular vulnerabilities and the fact that children with disabilities spend disproportionate uh, amounts of time on buses. And uh, so we're strongly in support of intro 455 of 2018. Let's get it done. Let's set a timeline for electrifying this fleet. Um, and additionally, we've, we've recently heard announcements that the city is acquiring uh, some of the bus providers, which were private fleets before. And we see that as a huge opportunity for the city to really set a gold standard with a new municipal fleet in terms of uh, sustainability, safety, um, and service for our city's school children. So we'd love to get that done. Um, finally, uh, no, not finally, <laughs> two more. Uh, the landmark commercial waste zones law that the council passed uh, a little over a year ago is finally being implemented. There was a rules hearing this morning. Um, We'd love to see a robust uh, version of it from an environmental and air quality uh, perspective passed that includes electrification of private sanitation fleets and big investments in recycling infrastructure. Um, and so while we know that implementation primarily rests with sanitation at this point, um, we do call on the council and want to work with Time the council expired. fully funded in the, the city budget, which could be a big issue. And then just very briefly, of course, we're fully in support of intro 980 and echo um, the comments of, of Sonal from WE Act and others in calling for let's let's bring the, the dirtiest buildings right into electrification and into a clean power grid and, and skip natural gas and fossil fuels. Thank you so much. We look forward to working with you. At this time, I'd like to ask if there's anyone else who's registered to testify but whose name I have not called. If so, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Constantinides for any closing remarks. I'll begin by recognizing uh, Councilmember Dharma Diaz, my apologies for not recognizing you earlier. It, it's difficult to see text messages on why I'm using my phone for the hearing because my internet issues today. So uh, thank you, Councilmember Diaz, for your patience and for being here. Um, I want to reiterate uh, some of the points today. I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Sonal and everyone else who has testified today that we do need, uh, as part of 980, uh, to bring these buildings to electrification rather than more fossil fuel. Um, so I think that this bill adding robust outreach to those buildings that are part of Local Law 97, but also those that aren't, making them aware of PACE financing and the ability uh, to switch over uh, is very important and something that um, I agree with and look forward to working on as we move these bills forward. Uh, so I wanna thank the administration uh, for all of their testimony today. I want to thank uh, all of uh, the, uh, the people who took the time out of their busy schedules during this very challenging moment in New York City to testify. Uh, thank you all for testifying today. 
Of course, I want to again thank our staff, our counsel, Samara Swanston, our policy analyst, Nadia uh, Johnson and Ricky Chawa, our financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, my legislative counsel and director, Nicholas Wazowski, uh, all the great sergeant at arms and all of our technical folks who are uh, unnamed today, but made all of this work when we had so many technical difficulties. Uh, I think Joanna Castro was in there uh, in that group. So thank you all for all of your great efforts uh, that aren't usually recognized. So uh, with that, uh, I will gavel uh, this committee hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee on January 26th virtually closed.